Recent days have witnessed a dramatic deterioration in relations between the world's two biggest economies after the U.S. ordered China to close its consulate in Houston and China made an equivalent move by closing the U.S. consulate in Chengdu. Observers believe the next three months leading up to the U.S. presidential election will be a highly dangerous period for the two countries. So what brought U.S.-China relations to this point in decades and where we are headed? Could neutral countries uh, such as India take sides amid the conflict? To discuss these issues and more, I'm joined by Dr. Zhao Hai from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Lawrence Brahm, documentary film director from Shambhala Studio, and Vijay Prashad, director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Zhou Yuan. Uh, let me start with you, Lawrence. Uh, tensions have been simmering uh, between U.S. and China for quite some time, and it seems the conflicts are going all directions, defense, trade, technology, media, and diplomacy. A and the consulate uh, closure spat is probably driving the bilateral ties to a spiral downward. You wrote in your China Daily piece that the Houston consulate was the first to open and is the first to go. That symbolism is very ironical. How did we get here? I think this is something that is disturbing a lot of us who have spent our lives building the China-U.S. relationship. I mean, I came here shortly after the establishment of relations in 79. I was one of the very first waves of students here in 1981. And that was a time when we were all seeking to build this relationship. We had so much optimism throughout the 80s, the 90s, China's entry into WTO, the Olympics, and there is so much space for collaboration and cooperation on technologies for environmental protection, addressing climate change right now, uh, exploration of space, of the oceans. We have so much we have to do together. And I think it's extremely disheartening for many of us, both Americans and Chinese, who have worked so hard for this relationship, to see it unraveling so quickly. This is a threshold. The closure of China's Consul General in Houston is a very, very major threshold in the deterioration of that relationship. And we could see a downward spiral if both sides continue to close each other's consulates. I think it's time for us all to take a deep breath and think about what we need to do right now to be saving our planet mm. and to be working together. And coronavirus has brought this into very, very sharp focus. China has probably the most collective experience in controlling this virus and getting a grip on it. And it's become politicized in America because of the elections. I think we need to think beyond this. And if we can actually get above the petty internal politics and start to be thinking globally again, then we might be able to turn this downward spiral back and begin start working to work together, first on global health care issues and then environment, because these are the two big crises that the whole world is facing. And the only two countries who can lead on it in solving these crises mm. are the United States and China together. And Zhao Hai, in the near term, if the U.S. continues unprecedented moves like closing a consulate, what can China do? Zhao Hai. All right, uh, it seems that there is some problem with the audio. A and Lawrence, what, what do you make of the uh, intensity of this kind of conflict? Is closing the consulate, uh, sending away the diplomats a normal thing to do if countries have issues to iron out? No. First of all, the closure of the consulate in Houston on the basis of intellectual property issues or technology issues is unnecessary. This is, this is a first strike. This is a, a, con, a combative or bellicose measure. 
China's closure of the consulate in Chengdu is a reciprocal measure. According mm -hmm. to uh, protocol, if you have five consulates in one country, you have to have five in another. I mean, it's, it's all reciprocal. So it's a, it's, a, it's a protocol move. So now it's up to the United States whether they're going to close another consulate. I think it's time just to take a breath uh -huh. and rethink the momentum of where things are going. Furthermore, uh, Mike Pompeo's speech at the Nixon Library in many ways is trying to herald back a Cold War. We don't need this at this time. We need a constructive dialogue. We need to be able to be working through the issues that are complex and technical, mm. but doing it in a constructive manner. And to start to say, oh, we should you know, roll back engagement. Uh, this, is not a, uh, this is not a constructive measure for the world and for world peace. We've just got too much mm. at stake for both countries to be working together. So it's time to stop the tit for tat, the closing back and forth, and it's time to start to think forward proactively mm. on what we need to do to get that relationship back in a constructive mode. Uh, Zhao Hai, well, maybe constructive is not a word a lot of Americans are very familiar with now. W mm. What do you say to China's plan if the U.S. continues to escalate the tensions and probably expel more diplomats, what can China do? Well, first of all, we have to see what exactly is the, the attention on the U.S. side. And we can derive that from the recent Pompeo speech at the Nixon Library. And I think he's very much calling for a new Cold War confrontational with China. And the closure of Houston Consulate is very much a culmination of the recent very aggressive and negative uh, activities, a series of activities from the U.S. side. And this one is particularly damaging because of the symbolism. The, the closure is actually symbolizing the burning or the destruction of the bridge mm. between U.S. and China, the communication. So therefore, you know, without communication, then there's nothing to talk about. They refuse to have a constructive relationship. They just wanted to burn the bridge and stop talking with China and forcing China to be so-called behave uh, according to their will. So China will not do that, and China will con continue to insist on a uh, peaceful coexistence and a win-win mutual respect relationship with the United States. So on the one hand, we will definitely retaliate whatever unreasonable activities from the U.S. side, but at the same time, we're hopeful, remain hopeful that American people, American society, and the world uh, at all, you know, together, will uh, resist this call for new Cold War and will unite together against this very extreme uh, measures from the U.S. But the problem is, can China retaliate measure by measure? Because uh, probably the Americans are calculating they have more leverages at their hands because more Chinese researchers in the U.S. and China is selling more goods to America. Maybe uh, China doesn't have as many cars as Americans do. Zhao well, just like what happened in the so-called, you know, the, the, the tax uh, retaliation, the added tariff uh, between the two countries, the U.S. believe that they have, because China sells more to the U.S., therefore, they have an upper hand. I think in this relationship, it's not up to whether or not tit for tat is working, but to show that the other side, that, uh, you know, you have the resolve to continue to play this game and to continue to push back against their unreasonable and very malicious, uh, you know, activities against you. So uh, even though, you know, in particular aspects, uh, China will not do exactly uh, the tit uh, you know, uh, tactic against the U.S., but mm. overall, I think the relationship must be reciprocal and balanced. That's what we are looking for. All right. We've also collected some opinions from the Internet on Sino-U.S. relations. Let's take a look what some of them have been saying. Uh, this is one from Weibo. A Cold War would only appear in the confrontation between the two strongly fortified blocs. The common interest between China and the U.S. cannot disappear overnight. And most countries have no intention to choose between China and the United States. China and the United States have not entered a Cold War, but a Cold Peace. So, Lawrence, how bad can it go? Uh, will it, now we have seen confrontations in diplomacy, in trade, economy, and technology, will it go to security? Will we have military confrontations? Anything's possible, particularly when you don't have rational minds at the steering wheel. 
And right now you have, in America, an election year. You've got a lot of hot-headedness. But I think what's more serious is you have an ideological foundation that's driving a lot of these decisions. There are certain individuals, and I must say there are individuals within the administration that have an ideological view on China, on the world. This is the reason for the decoupling, not only with China, but the entire disintegr disintegration of globalization under the current Trump administration. But do you think and hot think has have already taken control of the narratives and policies in the U.S., or there are other voices made challenging their position? Everything's changing each day, so we might be seeing hot heads in control at the moment. But there are also rational minds out there. And you have people who are also thinking long term, even if others are thinking short term. I think in this respect, you have two sets of calculations going on. On the American side, you have very much an ideological, theoretical approach toward China that's being adopted for certain reasons of that administration, which are, again, very ideologically based. Mm. You have on the China side very pragmatic calculations, which are viewing at how much the relationship is needed, how much synergy already exists, how both countries are in many ways tied together in an entanglement of relations that touch on finance, on trade, on, on so many areas. And so the result is both countries are calculating each other's move very, very differently. And to some extent, that's a reason for what we see now mm -hmm. as a disintegration, a rapid disintegration of the relationship. And Jahai, what is your reading of the intentions of the Americans? Because uh, it is not a monolithic place, uh, because Richard Haas, the president of the Council of Foreign Relations, he recently said that Pompeo's speech uh, misrepresented history and also advocated a China policy that is neither viable nor coherent. Uh, can China rely on Americans also have different views about China policies? Well, I want to emphasize two things. Uh, first of all, the ideological aspect is, uh, has long been existed in U.S. administration towards China. This is not something new. What's new is the misinterpretation and completely wrong explanation of history and reality. If you look at Pompeo's speech, I agree with uh, Ryan Haas. Uh, I, I think Mr. Haas' interpretation of uh, uh, Pompeo, he mi totally misinterpreted history and misinterpreted the mutual beneficial relationship between the two countries because of the engagement policy from the U.S. side. So I think um, if you have, you know, put on glasses, a colored lenses looking at this relationship and have a conclusion that no matter what China do, uh, there will only be negative impact on the U.S. side, then you won't have any proper conclusion from that bilateral relationship. So ideology is not uh, and, and, you know, pure reason, uh, only reason that from the U.S. side they change the policy. And but secondly, there mm. are so many different voices in the U.S. and uh, many pragmatic and reasonable voices are now being depressed because now these hawks in D.C. are in control. So I think, you know, reasonable voices will come out once these, uh, these people are no longer in control and they don't have this very repressive uh, propaganda that is going on in the U.S. But probably the China hawks are in the driver's seats right now. What can China do to change um, the direction of the U.S.-China policy? Uh, is it a realistic way to send the messages out that this is not the way that we are supposed to go? Well, currently, like because the... I'm yeah. sorry. Mm. Go ahead first. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. Okay, so currently the, the, the Hawks, the hotliners are in control in, the, you know, in part of the White House. I won't say uh, every cabinet. Uh, there are other people, particularly after the phase one trade deal between U.S. and China, uh, there are people, I think, in the Trump administration still want to stick to the deal and continue this mutually beneficial economic, financial, you know, all kinds of relationship with China, educational uh, and others. However, I think the Hawks in control of particular departments like uh, the Justice Department, like the FBI or the State Department, they want to go hardline against China. Mm. And also, there are, you know, uh, bu bureaucracy, those, pra th those uh, professionals in the Trump administration still believe in a very pragmatic and mutually beneficial relationship. They don't want to go with uh, the Pompeo uh, sort of uh, foreign policy. If you look at recent 
uh, hearings in the Senate uh, and the speech from uh, Begin, and I think his tone is quite different from what Pompeo said uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, Lawrence, you've been living in China for more than three decades. What do you think the Chinese should do to let Americans probably have a second thought? Well, first of all, I think I agree that ideology has been a driving force not only in the Republican administration, also in the Democratic administration. There is a very, so we say, a very fixed ideology that's been running through. But I think in this particular administration, that ideology has a added component, and that is a very McCarthyist era thinking about the world and about China and other countries and that are, are in, so we say, the South Bloc. And so the result is it's a very hardline approach, and it's one that is very intolerant. And having lived here for decades, we have worked on a basis of tolerance. Of you know, when we when we bring co when companies come into China, they're trying to understand the market. They have to understand the market. Likewise, when Chinese are going out, they're trying to understand the world. That takes a lot of work. It takes a long time to build something. It, it's very, very quick to tear it apart. It's very easy to tear something apart. But we've been building something for a long, long time. I do believe that that has lasting strands, and there are rational people out there in Washington who are looking beyond this, but they don't have a voice right now. They are being repressed. The media is coming out with one tone. It's, it's, it's monolithic. It is not open, it's not analytical, it's not looking at the total picture of relations, it's not looking at the questions of technology, um, it's not looking at the recipro reciprocity. But and so if that's the run fact into this that the sentiment in America is so hostile against China, and that has been reigning uh, the media and the political landscape, uh, what would you, would you advise the Chinese government and businesses do? First of all, got to keep a cool head. Again, on a diplomatic level, if you have something like a closure of a consulate, you have protocols, you have to reciprocally close the other one on your side. This is a reciprocity and a protocol, but maintain a cool head because if there's too much reaction, then the other side and the media will use it and distort it even further. We're at a time right now where the media in America is distorting everything for political reasons. It's becoming very, very exacerb exacerbated. Even the coronavirus, there's so many different opinions and so much confusing information that's in circulation right now that is creating a lot of domestic conflict, particularly mm -hmm. as we run up the next 100 days for the, uh, before the election. So this is a time for cool heads, thinking through things, responding, but not reacting. And Zhao Hai, what do you think? What does it take to cool down and, and, and doing something constructive? Well, uh, a number of and things. And who should first take I the wanna, initiative? Yeah, first I want to point out uh, one line in Pompeo's speech. He said he wanted to discontinue engagement and make sure that it won't return. So that's very, that's very important. Why he, he's thinking that engagement will return in any case. Uh, that is uh, because his extreme policy towards China won't be, uh, you know, won't standing once he's out of the office and once the American people realize uh, that road down, you know, down that road is not going to be good for American national interest. So I think in order to restore the relationship uh, back to normal, one thing uh, what we can do from Chinese perspective is that we're going to continue our current uh, way without interruption from the U.S. side and continue to reform and open up mm. to the world. You know, other people will see the benefit of that and against this current the Trump administration's policy right now. And also, I think w within the U.S., we're going to open up more and more uh, communication channels, try to uh, get around this, you know, very harsh crackdown from the U.S. government and letting American people know the real intention of the Chinese government and Chinese people and how friendly, uh, friend re friendly relationship can continue uh, beyond this one administration. And Lawrence, probably the world also deserves an answer. What will happen if the number one economy and number two economy in the world diverges or even uh, in conflicts with each other? What does it mean for the rest of the world? 
There is no advantage to a conflict. This will put the whole world in conflict. There is absolutely nothing that will benefit anybody in this thing at all. And I also concur with what was just said. People like myself, many of us actually, on the ground here and others who are back in Washington, in New York, in San Francisco, have been spending decades building this relationship. I don't believe that one or two or a handful of very hard-headed um, ideologues can actually end that relationship, can disengage that relationship. That relationship will continue. It's just a question of getting through this period and getting through this type of thinking, this type of ideology. Uh, pragmatism ultimately will be in the benefit of everyone, yeah. not only in China and the United States, but in terms of global relations. And so a conflict is not in the interest of anybody. Nobody will benefit from this at the end. It may get some publicity for an election. It may stir up a lot of you know, emotions among a certain electorate. But if you think of the interests involved in business, finance, across the board, cultural exchange, even technology, who's in Silicon Valley, who are the programmers? A lot of these are Chinese. They're also Indians. There's so much that has been established through the network of global communications and entanglements right now that this is not an easy thing to break up. Mm. And anything that would do that would be short term. Tahai, do you agree this is just a blip, but the trend will probably uh, cycle back? Uh, it's a not... dangerous blip. It's a dangerous yeah. blip because if hotheads take control, and if events spiral in a negative, conflicting way, then mm. anything can happen. Yeah, but, but we cannot we count that the hot hands will, will, will go. Let anything's positive. This. But if we can have yeah. pragmatism and some cool heads drive this thing through, the other side of the tunnel, there's light. And I see this relationship having a much longer, longer perspective. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that what was built up over these 40 years can be taken away okay. so quickly. And Tahai, are you optimistic or uh, pessimistic? Yeah, in the, in, well, in the long run, I am um, optimistic, but in the short run, I'm pessimistic because, uh, let's face it, we have, I mean, U.S. and China both have real problems domestically and internationally. We have uh, differences and disputes. Uh, between the two countries. So we have to work this out. We have to put in a lot of hard work, keep communication lines open, and know each other's bottom lines. So I think um, it's not easy to get this relationship back to normal. However, we have to try. Uh, at this point, I mean, uh, with these hawks in, in office, it's very difficult. People easily get despaired. Uh, but I think hope remains. And mm -hmm. one thing I want to, I want to add uh, is that not everybody suffers from U.S.-China deteriorating relationship. There is a very small group of people currently are benefiting from this, uh, uh, you know, racking relationship because they can actually uh, grow their business, you know, consulting or giving bad advice uh, by making money from this. So I think we have to pay attention to these people earning money or making a living by advising uh, you know, the U.S. government trying to continue to make this relationship e uh, harder and harder uh, to turn around. Uh, but, but a lot of uh, China experts in the U.S., uh, before that, they are probably uh, pragmatic, but more and more uh, not so upbeat about the prospect. Uh, as Rafogo, the famous American China hand said, He's the uh, writer of the biography of Deng Xiaoping. Uh, he said, uh, there is a possibility of armed confrontation between the two countries. If there is a scuffle in South China Sea, it could escalate. Is this the worst scenario we can see? Well, that's the worst case scenario. But at this point, I don't see that both sides will, will you know, likely or willing to go there. And particularly, I think, both armies uh, from both sides would like to see a war between the, uh, between the two sides to broke out uh, either in South China Sea or anywhere else in the world. So I think the, even though there are hot hats in the White House, but still there are uh, very professional uh, diplomats and uh, military service people uh, are still in charge in the front line. So hopefully uh, they will follow the rules and continue to keep the peace uh, in, around China and also around the globe. And now we have Vijay on the line. Well, Vijay, uh, a new international body 
uh, of uh, act activists and academics have warned the world against the sliding into a new Cold War uh, between China and the U.S. You are a member of the campaign. Can you tell us what guys are you doing to, to, to send the alarm to the world? I'm very glad to be with you. I want to say that this is a, a series of very alarming developments, not only the rhetorical inflation from U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, but statements coming from Japan about uh, the necessity on their part for a first strike policy, um, very dangerous rhetoric from India and Australia, the Quad indeed stepping up pressure. It's for this reason that we felt it very important to reach out to the world and call for dialogue, not escalation, in both the South China Sea and broadly around Asia and Eurasia. You know, we saw the pressure up in Ukraine. We've seen the Galwan incident uh, between India and China. Uh, we've seen in the South China Sea very touch and go incidents. And so we are calling for a new uh, sober look at, at events between the United States, particularly in China, and for the United States to back off from the rhetoric and to go back to the table, clear the decks on the trade deal, and not use military force as a mm. proxy either for internal domestic politics or for trade. Yeah. And Zhao Hai, uh, of course, um, there are people also uh, saying that China is now uh, facing challenges from multiple fronts. For example, India's relations with China is being strained. Uh, uh, there are uh, increasing voices uh, from Europe about how China should establish its investment treaty uh, with Europe. And America, of course, is in a, a Cold War mode with China. Uh, what should China's diplomacy uh, be doing? Well, first of all, uh, all these problems that, that you described, of course, there are bilateral problems. But mostly, if you look at recent U.S. activities, these are because the U.S. is pushing those countries, giving them pressures and trying to entice them into some sort of conflict or so-called pushback against China. So I think once the source uh, that in China is reducing their uh, negative uh, at at attention to China, things will uh, quiet down between China and other countries, so European countries. Uh, the other thing is that China will continue to try to uh, have better relationship with uh, neighboring countries and also with European Union by improving economic ties, trade investment, and also cooperating on COVID-19, uh, fighting this disease globally and helping developing countries by working with those countries. So China will focus on positive side of, in of international cooperation, and that way I think China's intention will become much better understood in those mm. countries to, you know, not letting go, uh, l not letting them follow in the U.S. Does China see America is doing a divide and conquer, a and what should China do in response? Probably Pompeo urged India to reduce dependence on China uh, for communication. He's also uh, selling the sim similar messages in Europe. What should China do? Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, well, one thing China can counter the uh, Pompeo, uh, you know, activity is that China should, uh, you know, work more closely with the uh, European counterparts and trying to persuade them, you know, by focusing on the current challenges. Because Pompeo is talking about something very remote and, and, and not uh, and not really the current focus on, of the uh, uh, of the globe. So I think people should focus on. Uh, getting back uh, particular, uh, particular economic recovery mm. after COVID-19 and control of the spread of the disease. So only by, you know, uh, letting people know that we, ch working with China pragmatically can benefit, can achieve mutual m beneficiary, can we overcome the uh, Pompeo's really malicious intentions trying to separate China and all those other countries. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Zhao Hai. And you've been watching Dialogue here on CGTN. I'm Zhou in Beijing. Goodbye for now.